just trying to survive and learn to love along the way by foreplay on AO3. Episode 3, Chapter 3 of Rest and Recuperation. The sight that greets them is at least better than how the little listener looked when it saw she had picked them up a few hours ago. The poor kid is half asleep as a nurse covers up the last of his guts. Shoda certainly looks relieved as they pulled up chairs on the left of the bed, and the nurse leaves without a word, Midoriya falling asleep easily once they've settled. Now what, Cho? Shoda looked conflicted at his question, and hesitates before answering. I'm not sure, Sashi. We're not letting him go back there. I can't. But I don't want to throw him into the foster care either. We don't have many options. Are you saying what I think you're saying? We're taking the little listener home with us? If it's alright with you, Sashi. I just know we need to keep an eye on him. And what better way to do that than from our own home? If Sashi couldn't have said it better himself. This kid is going to need a lot of love to recover. And Asashi knows that both he and Shoda are more willing to provide that. Sho, you should know by now that I wasn't going to let you leave without the little listener. You know that I've been wanting to adopt. You're going soft on me, bringing home a stray without me having to beg. Shoda shoots him a quirk-assisted glare at that. But Asashi just laughs and grabs his husband's hand. They're quiet a few moments before he speaks again. Hey, Sho, what if he doesn't want to come with us? We can't exactly force him. The thought is unpleasant, but Asashi doubts that many kids would want to move in with their teachers. Toda's hand tightens around his before he answers. Then we'll find him a safe place where he does want to go, and we'll keep an eye on him from afar. The words are said with a slight frown, as if Shoda doesn't want that to be the case. It's all she knows that he doesn't. They sit there, silent for a while, just watching Midoriya, before Sashi gets up and stretches. Ugh, I'm gonna get home and nap before school in a few hours. You, Sho, are gonna stay here with the little listener and email Nezu that you need someone to cover for you today. He leans over and should have meet him halfway for a soft kiss before they part. Love you, Sho. I love you too, Sashi. It takes a while after Sashi leaves for Shota to actually do something. But once he does, he regrets not starting earlier. He starts with a short email to Nezu, telling him that he and the problem child will be absent. He doesn't add any more than that, instead choosing to put more detail into an email to the rest of the Hero Corps staff if only so they don't hound him with questions or come and bother them. He specifically asks that no one comes to the hospital, because he doesn't know how Midoriya would handle all the attention from pro heroes, or any students that tagged along. Shota doesn't think he would appreciate his peers seeing him in this state. He makes sure to mention that they suspect Midoriya's mother in the assailants. He knows that All Might has met her, and it's seen to have a soft spot for the woman. This could go very poorly, very quickly. It's not long after he had sent that Midoriya is stirring, dull green eyes searching the room before landing on him. Hasn't Mike? The question is hardly a whisper, voice groggy from sleep and pain meds. He had to go home before going to school today. With that, the problem child is struggling to sit up, face contorted with pain. He got an arm around his middle and tears in his eyes, but it seems as though nothing short of death will stop this kid from wanting to go to school. Shota places a gentle hand on his shoulder and presses him back down before continuing. I already told Nezu that we're not coming in. Besides, Sashi will be back after school, and we've got to talk to Detective Sukuichi before then. So, you're not leaving? Midoriya sounds almost desperate for him to stay. Of course not, problem child. Shota says, the nickname as fond as he dares. And Midoriya relaxes at his answer, previous tension melting away. Shota allows himself a small smile before pulling out his phone to deal with the responses he could feel arriving as they spoke. 
Nezu keeps his short, agreeing that he'll get Snipe to cover his homeroom. Shota snorts and wonder how long it would take for him to shoot one of his students. Most of the other teachers have answered his emails with concerned and simple wishes well. But Midnight asks what they can tell Midoriya's friends about his absence. Shota sends out a mass response, telling them that nobody can say anything about the situation, and leaves it at that. If one concerned student found out, then they would all. Who knows how upset Midoriya would be at that? Shota sides, powering down his phone before looking back at Midoriya. He's already fallen back asleep. Baru's face turned towards him. He looks incredibly young in this moment, completely dwarfed by the large hospital bed. Midoriya wakes to a gentle hand in his hair. Azawa-sensei leaning over to tell him he's meeting Sukuichi by the entrance of the hospital, and that he'll be back shortly. He's gone, and for the first time since everything started, Midoriya is left alone with his thoughts. A quick glance at the clock by his bed tells him that it's just past 10 a.m. It's only been 12 hours since his world was flipped upside down. He remembers less than half of that most of it blocked by shock and pain. It's not shocking that she hurt him, but she's never gone this far before. The pure anger in her expression had terrified him, but seemed only to encourage her. She must have forgotten that he's surrounded by pro heroes and teachers that seem to actually care about him, as opposed to how all his old teachers treated him. Midoriya has never been so grateful for his good memory than he was, pounding all of his change into that painful and dialing Aisawa sensei's number. He's been so relieved that he looked up, and the racer head was standing over him, that he drove forward and clung onto the hero, forgetting that the man was his scary, no nonsense homeroom teacher, only registering his hero coming to save him from the pain. He had felt hurt and so scared that when Aizawa-sensei had asked him about his quirk, he spilled everything, everything about that day and what All Might said to him. His teacher's reassurance was like a breath of fresh air, feelings he'd hidden inside for so long getting validated by someone he'd known he could trust to tell him the truth. Midoriya's musings were cut short when there was a soft knock on his door and a powered-up All Might just waltzing into his hospital room. Young Midoriya, I heard you've been injured and thought you would appreciate a nice surprise. Midoriya frowned, wondering what sort of surprise All Might was talking about. The man moved away from the door to reveal someone standing behind him, pale face covered in tears. M mom Oh. My. Fucking. God. No. No. All Might. All Might. No. All Might. All Might. What did you do? All Might. All Might. Oh my fucking god, All Might. Okay, well, we'll- we'll touch on those- We'll touch on that in a second. I wanted to talk about how my theory was correct with Izuku saying, um, where- where is it? Uh, da 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 it's not shocking that she hurt him, but she's never gone this far before, right? Um, right here. It's not shocking that she hurt him, but she's never gone this far before. It is exactly what I thought. She has never gone that far, and that had scared him, and he ran, right? Um, and, you know, obviously I think it helped that he was surrounded by pro heroes uh, at UA, that he actually had a support system now, because that's the biggest thing about um, manipulators. If you don't have a support system, it makes it 20 times more harder to realize that you're in a, a very not healthy relationship, whether it be platonic, uh, friendship, uh, whether it be uh, a friendship, a relationship, or a familiarship. Um, it's really hard to understand that that relationship with that person is um, not okay when you don't have a support system helping you navigate through that. I've seen it firsthand with people in my life who go back to really manipulative people who have hurt them, whether physically or emotionally. Uh, and 
they just keep going back because their support system isn't encouraging or helping them or in any way, shape or form. I have a certain friend who no longer talks to their ex because I made them realize that that person was not a good person. In fact, every time that that person tries to nuzzle their way back into their life, guess who they talk to? Me. They go to me and they tell me, hey, this person's back in. And I explain to them calmly, hey, this is the strategy that they're using to manipulate you. This is this, this is this, this is how you react. And um, obviously they have slip ups, but the biggest thing is I'm always there for them. Even when they go back and they do dumb stuff, I say, hey, look, I'm not mad. I'm not disappointed. This is okay. I want you to get better for you, not for me. This is for you, not for me. And I'm lucky that, um, you know, obviously things are getting better and stuff. But uh, I saw a comment the other day uh, that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But when you don't have a support group, someone who's sitting there and telling you that this person's not a good person, it's really hard to understand that that's happening. And even after once you understand, it's really hard to get out because you don't have people to help you, right? If you're really stuck, like financially stuck with this person, how the fuck are you going to get out if the only person you could turn to is the same person who trapped you? Like, think about it. It's hard. I know it's hard. I once had a manipulator who literally embedded themselves, embedded themselves into my life to the point where when I decided to stop being friends with them, in my head, I thought I was going to lose everyone except my online friends and this one friend because everybody else was going to believe her over me. And fortunately, that was not true. Fortunately, I still had friends. But she made it seem as though I didn't. And that's how they wrap you in. That's how they get you. That's how they have you. That's how they control you. Um, On to the comment that I saw, somebody mentioned the fact that I mentioned that food is a way to control someone, right? And someone mentioned that, um, a, a very uh, point that I should mention, there is a difference between choosing to not give someone food and not being able to. One is abuse. The other is just not being able to, right? So a parent not feeding their child like the food that they're supposed to because they don't have the money or the resources or anything to actually feed them, that is one thing, right? Obviously, it's still not good for the child, but not in the sense of like the parents are hurting them, in the sense that unfortunately, they're not, they can't, they can't, they can't do anything about that. And yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times kids in those situations do still get taken from their parents, um, but not because the parents did something wrong, but because the parents can't take care of the kid. They don't have the money to take care of the kid. And unfortunately, that happens, right? But they're not taken forever. They're taken and the parents then have to build up their life again. Get money, get resources, get everything that they can to then get, get the child back. Obviously, if the child was in an abusive home, that normally doesn't happen. The child gets taken for good, right? They get taken and then they get placed in another place. That is not them. But um, that is different from when a parent actively chooses to take food away from a child um, when they very much could give them food, when they actively choose to hold food uh, over the person, right? Um, think Hunger Games. Why do you think that they don't give them enough food? It's a control thing. It's literally a control thing. And the worst thing about, um, you know, obviously children who get manipulated is that they uh, they experience this phenomenon called learn helplessness. They experience it. I've mentioned this in a different series, but I'll mention this again here if you don't know what it is. Learn helplessness is the phenomenon that even though you have an escape route, even though you have a way to leave this painful situation, you stay. Because in your mind, you can't leave. There was an experiment done on dogs. It was three categories of dogs. Dogs that didn't receive the, the control panel. Dogs who didn't receive shocks at all. Dogs who receive shocks but are able to stop the shocks by pressing a button. And dogs who are not able to stop the shock no matter what. They put those dogs through that experiment for a while, which, by the way, unethical. 
it's not allowed. Those type of experiments are no longer allowed nowadays, but back in that time, it was okay to have these type of uh, experiments. Obviously nowadays that's not allowed. That is ethically not okay. And there is rules and regulations to stop those type of experiments from happening. Um, and in uh, the second part of the, the whole thing, uh, the whole uh, experiment, they introduced a different type of shock, a shock that would only occur in half of the room. The dogs who were in the category that were able to stop the shock with a button, although they didn't all walk to the other side and figured out that that's how to stop it, they all tried, right? Most of them tried to stop the shocks in some way, shape, or form. The dogs who were continuously shocked and had no way of stopping it, most of them laid down and accepted it. Which is sad. It makes me sad. It makes me cry. But think about it. Why do you think circuses train animals like tigers and elephants from a young age? Right? Like, for example, elephants. Sometimes circus elephants from way back in days, they would be held by this tiny ass fucking pole and this leash. Like, that elephant could override that at any second. Why do you think they don't? Because at a young age, they would put them there and the elephant couldn't get out. So as the elephant grows stronger, the elephant doesn't do anything anymore. They learned helplessness. That is the phenomena of learned helplessness, which oftentimes explains a uh, part of why people who are in horrible situations don't leave. They have learned to just be helpless. Right? Now, this isn't always the case. There's obviously a bunch of different reasons why people wouldn't leave uh, a toxic situation. Uh, there obviously is the case of, is it, you know, family? Is it someone they really, really love? And there's obviously all, like, the biggest case of sometimes you don't want to admit that the people you love and the people you trusted are horrible people. You don't want to admit that you chose to accept and trust the wrong person. It's hard for you to comprehend in your mind that someone you love, someone you put all your trust into, someone that you care about can hurt you or another person. It's hard. Why do you think all those people who found out that their loved ones were serial killers or killers or serial rapists, they are always so shocked because in their mind, they don't think that that person is capable of doing that. And it is understandable why. Right. You know, it's it's understandable. So in this case, in this situation, I very much um, uh, think that Inko used food, used hitting him as a form of controlling him. And it wasn't super big to the point where Izuku ran, but it was enough to the point where Izuku just thought, this is my life. It is what it is. I have to stay. This is my life. I have nowhere else to run. I can't go to the teachers. They don't give a shit. I can't go to Bakugo. They don't, he doesn't fucking care. No adult in my life cares. What's the point in trying to get help when no one is going to help me? He learned helplessness. And I am glad that that snapped out and that he has a support system that actually helps him and that he didn't get trapped. Right, I'm glad that we didn't beat around the bush and we just went straight into saving him because I know that this is going to be fucking hard because this is a really long fanfic. And considering how fucking long it is, right, it's almost three books worth long, by the way. I really, really hope that, uh, oh god, I'm crying. <laughs> that we get a, 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 speedy, a speedy, you know, recovery and like the rest is like happy, cheerful, cute moments. It's not going to happen, <laughs> but one can wish, you know? Um, okay, now I'm going to go on to the elephant in the room. What the fuck? Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh! Oh my. You fucking idiot. Look, all my. I don't know how horrible you are in this fanfic or not. I feel like you probably aren't bad, but like, oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Please, for the love of fucking God. God. Oh my. Oh, oh my, we talk about this. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Come on, oh my. Oh my, why? 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 Okay. 
I'm gonna end this. This is almost as long as the actual fanfic itself, uh, the chapter itself. As always, my rain drops. Make sure to eat, sleep, drink water, take your meds, have a wonderful day or night. Link to my Discord server and socials are down in the description. Subscribe to see more of my content, and thank you so much for watching.